So what I want to um, ask you to do is have just a paper and pen handy for yourselves. And I'm going to welcome Melanie. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to ask you to just do a very brief writing for yourself. If you have online paper, like print, printing paper, that's the best thing. So if you have no lines, there are fewer internal restrictions about what you come up with. So yeah, just a piece of paper and a pen. And what I want you to do, so most of you have been on um, Tracy's poetry experiences for months now, and I think they've been a sustaining grace for many. Um, and here we are living into this pandemic and being Baba lovers. So we have a different kind of perspective than much of the world has, but we're still deeply impacted by it because we live in it. So I want you to just think about yourself briefly. This is not anything you need to share, but see if you can just take a travel inside um, for a little bit and just make contact with some kind of a loss that you are aware of in yourself. It could be the loss of a person, the loss of a place, of a pet, of a situation, of some internal something in your psyche that maybe you've uh, been dealing with. And notice your breathing and notice your body experiences. So do travel inside your body because sometimes our sense of grief and loss can be located inside somewhere. And when we have the sensitivity to pay attention to that, it really, it creates a new navigation system for appreciating who we are. So see if as you do that and listening to my words, just let yourself find a spot, let yourself find a situation or a person or something, doesn't matter what it is. It can be something far away from your current life or something really close up right now. And sometimes we might not know what it is, but we experience it somatically. So as you breathe into your thoughts and your feelings and your memories, see if you can also just pick up your pen and just very briefly write down whatever that is for yourself that you're aware of tonight that connects you in some way with grief and loss. And maybe what you do is you just boil it down to one or two sentences. And this is not something you need to share in the group. This is for you. <clears throat> so I can't see everybody on the call, but I can see a couple of you on the call. So um, if you've been able to do that, even if it's just writing down a phrase, just give me a little thumbs up that you've been able to do that. Okay, good. All right. Um, so as we explore poetry tonight, um, keep your pen and paper handy. And if as you listen, I mean, listening to poetry is a little like watching a dance conference experience, right? It's, it's a movement that takes, takes place in time, but it passes by us quickly. And sometimes it's hard to pull back. Sometimes it's just a feeling we get from it, which is very important. But sometimes it helps to anchor what we're hearing, what we're listening to. Maybe there was a key phrase or a word in a poem that just grabbed you. You don't need to know why. It's not about that tonight. It's about your felt experience. So as you listen, see if there might be something in a particular poem that that is fetching for you. And you just write down a word or a phrase. And eventually what happens, it's sort of like Baba's beads on one string. Eventually what begins to be created is a pattern that you can look at, hold on to, 
and appreciate in some new way about yourself. So it's really about your experience, not about a performance. Okay, so we, are we ready to go? Thank so you. I wanna just say a little bit about, so grief and loss, there's always a physical component to it. And when we can find a way to safely enter our bodies and locate it, it helps us, it creates a mapping system for us and it helps us to navigate wherever we're going and we often don't know where that is. Um, but I like to think of this idea of longing and belonging and that they're sort of companions to each other that as, as Baba lovers and, and mystics, um, there's always a sense of longing that's present. And part of what matters is if we can learn how to companion ourselves through that journey. So I just, I wanna just start with a poem by Rilke called Go to the Limits of Your Longing. Translated and read by Joanna Macy. God speaks to each of us as he makes us, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly hear. You, sent out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing. Embody me. Flare up like a flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. <clears throat> Can I follow that with a poem about longing? Absolutely. This is a poem I wrote um, <clears throat> at the center. And um, it, uh, I was, uh, it was Christmas time <clears throat> and I was thinking I was <laughs> stuffing uh, Christmas food in my mouth and uh, noticed that I was doing this. And um, I finally said to myself, um, step away from the fruitcake, Tracy, and write a poem about it. So um, it was my reflection on um, the way we, we go to addiction instead of having the willingness to, um, to look at what it is we're longing for. And it's somehow buried in my long list of poems that I pulled up here. I have become a consumer of everything around me to distract me from my emptiness. I am an unfilled chalice, afraid of itself. Any power which lights into me, I pour out immediately, as if politely making room for something else. Like stars that go unseen by busy people. This mystery of self and other is so simple as to elude us again and again. Today, an evergreen tree waved at me as if to say, you are seen. You are seen. Mm. All of life says this in one way or another. A rose offers her fragrance to us. Flowering dogwood remains still enough to allow us to climb into her arms. Life is like this, entreating us to drink from the open well and be satisfied. Then our thirst 
becomes a friend, then our thirst becomes a friend. And we no longer mistake a mirage for that which can quench our longing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Last line of that poem inspired by Mir Baba talking about the mirage can never quench our thirst. Mm. Addiction. That's a beautiful line, Tracy. Wow. <clears throat> Thanks for the segue. Um, I think I'm going to read one now. Tracy and I are kind of winging this. We've shared our content with each other, but we're sort of, we'll just see how we pass it back and forth between us. Um, this next one is called um, For the Sake of Strangers by Dorian Lau. <clears throat> So, you know, sometimes with grief and loss, the feelings can be so intense that we just experience them in parts of our body. And that's what becomes our dominant. So I know for myself, when I've been in situations of deep grief, I usually carry it in my gut. And it's my gut that tells me, whoa, something big is going on here. And so it it's been a lesson to me over time to just try to listen um, to my body and to see what it wants to share with me. And I think all of us, because grief is such a powerful experience, there's always a part of the human experience that just wants to push it away because it hurts. It's challenging. It's hard. Um, we feel isolated and disconnected. It's unpleasant. We don't know what to say to people. But if we can give ourselves permission to just feel the weight of it, it's a, it provides us with a thread that we can begin to follow. So that's why I like this poem, For the Sake of Strangers. No matter what the grief, its weight, we are obliged to carry it. We rise and gather momentum the dull strength that pushes us through crowds. And then the young boy gives me directions so avidly. A woman holds the glass door open, waits patiently for my empty body to pass through. All day it continues, each kindness reaching toward another. A stranger singing to no one as I pass on the path trees offering their blossoms, a retarded child who lifts his almond eyes and smiles. Somehow, they always find me, seem even to be waiting, determined to keep me from myself, from the things that call to me, as it must have once called to them, this temptation to step off the edge and fall weightless away from the world. Would you like me to play the um, <clears throat> Coleman Barks piece about love dogs? Yeah. I think we're going to bookend. So um, one of the great things about the Baba community is that we're so beautifully immersed and incubated in the work of Rumi and Hafez. And um, <clears throat> this is Coleman Barks, the primary translator of Rumi, who lives in Athens, Georgia. Uh, reading um, 
a poem that really changed my life about grief and it's called Love Dogs. One night, a man was crying, Allah, Allah. One night, a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising until a cynic said so. I have heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer for that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep where he dreamed he saw Hitter, the guide of souls, in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Mm. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. <laughs> there are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. One night a man was crying. One night a woman was crying. Allah. What, <clears throat> what I love so much about that poem is that it reminds us that, you know, so often we, we, we push grief away because, as you said, it's, it's so heavy and are, are, we're so un, unprepared for the heaviness of it. But that poem reminds me that grief is actually a doorway that we can walk through mm. and that it can take us some, someplace that we haven't been before in our lives and that that, in fact, might in, be even the reason that it's there to act as the doorway to take us into a new room mm. that that our that our being knows we need to enter yeah. but we we haven't had the courage to to open the door and so the grief sort of either often takes us dragging by the hair or um you know can gently lead us in <laughs> if we can make it's friends with it <laughs> Not familiar. <laughs> when we can make friends with grief, we can walk through the doorway together, which is just so, so, so much more graceful than, um, you know. Yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you, Tracy. I love that. So um, here's one by Derek Walcott. And um, Let me see if I can find it here. I'm going to show a picture of Derek Walcott while you're looking for it. Oh, great. Such a beautiful man from the West Indies. Oh, love. Ooh, wow. Won oh, several lovely, Tracy. major awards as both a playwright and a poet and taught at your um, at Yale where Evie has done work and at Boston University and um, in the University of Alberta in Canada and uh, started out as a painter before he was a poet. 
Oh, how great. Oh, that's a lovely photo. Passed, in, passed 20 years ago. So this poem by Derek Walcott is called Odd Job, a Bull Terrier. You prepare for one sorrow, but another comes. It is not like the weather. You cannot brace yourself. The unreadiness is all. Your companion, the woman, the friend next to you, the child at your side, and the dog. We tremble for them. We look seaward and muse, it will rain. We shall get ready for rain. You do not connect the sunlight altering the darkening oleanders in the sea garden, the gold going out of the palms. You do not connect this, the fleck of the drizzle on your flesh with the dog's whimper. The thunder doesn't frighten. The readiness is all. What follows at your feet is trying to tell you the silence is all. It is deeper than the readiness. It is sea deep, earth deep, love deep. The silence is stronger than thunder. We are stricken dumb and deep as the animals who never utter love as we do, except it becomes unutterable and must be said in a whimper, in tears, in the drizzle that comes to our eyes, not uttering the loved thing's name, the silence of the dead. The silence of the deepest buried love is the one silence. And whether we bear it for beast, for child, for woman or friend, it is the one love. It is the same and it is blessed, deepest by loss. It is blessed. It is blessed. I have to follow that with my very favorite Derek Walcott poem, which um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard, uh, many of you have heard, it's called Love After Love. Wow. I, I'm just, I just, it's just hits that on the, on the, on the head for me. Mm -hmm. The time will come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorites. May I read two short ones? Yes. Please? OK. Short. <laughs> Thank you. Did you write them? No. No. One is by Langston Hughes and the other by James Joyce, just related to loss. Great. So one, one reads, Langston Hughes reads, I love my friend. He went away from me. There's nothing more to say. The poem ends, soft as it began. I loved my friend. Mm. Mm. One, simple enough. And the next is um, James Joyce, just uh, one line basically. They lived and laughed and loved and loved. <laughs> Read that one again. Yeah. They, li they lived and laughed and loved and left. <laughs> Gee, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty terse summary, isn't it? It's like a good life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs 15 stanzas when it's that pure and simple? That's yeah. great. Thank you, Melanie. A little hopeful, yeah. 
Evie, can I read this piece by Stanley Kunitz, you know, that we I shared with you at lunch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stanley Kunitz was a good friend of Mary Oliver's and was a really encouraged her to write. He died about 15 years ago and um, won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry. And he was a big gardener. And uh, there's a beautiful book of his work, if you'd like to read more, called The Wild Braid, which is really about his life in his garden near, near where she lived in Massachusetts. And it's a commentary about um, writing because I know we have writers um, on the call. And um, it's a commentary about the power of, of just giving yourself permission, which I think is one of the things that Evie's talking about here to feel these feelings in your body, but also to give yourself permission to write about them, which, which uh, can transform everything just to put pen to paper. So this is what Stanley Kunitz said about, about writing poetry. I want to perfect my craft so that I will not have to tell lies. So often when you are stumped, the temptation is just to back down. But when you feel this is too complicated or tenuous and that there is no way that you can say it, you have to persuade yourself that you can say it, that there is a way of saying it, that there is nothing that is unsayable. Mm. There is this moment when you suddenly open a door and enter into the room of the unspeakable. You somehow crack the shell, separating you from the unknown. Poetry is a secret language. It is not a domestic language, and it contains within itself the secret source of one's own life energy and life's convictions. And it is therefore not immediately translatable. Mm. It reminds me so much of, you know, all the beautiful things Mayor Baba has said about silence. To me, poetry is like the next best thing to silence. Mm. So that makes me think of, and I hope, by the way, you're all continuing to just write down a word or a phrase from any of these things. And now that we're sort of at this point, just take a peek at what you've written, what you started with as a focus for your sense of grief and loss. And any phrases or words that you've written down as a way to track your own process. Just take a peek at it and just see what it is that you notice. And it might be that, hmm, you're not really seeing how they connect or it might be just something becomes clear and you, you see this kind of lineage that you've created just by paying attention to yourself. And whether it's connecting or whether it's distant from you right now, just know that the process that you've been willing to engage in will make a difference to you, even if you don't know how at this moment. So I wanna read you one by Mary Oliver called In Black Water Woods. Look. The trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light and giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, it's nameless now, every year, Everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things, to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go.
I'd like to read one now, Tracy, if, unless you have one right the second, do you? No, go ahead, Jer. Okay. So this is one by John O'Donohue, a tremendous Irish poet who was a priest, who left the priesthood and fell in love. And there's a story told about John O'Donohue by David White, the English poet. Um, and one day they were walking along in a field and David White's father was walking with him. And David was encouraging his father to have John O'Donohue, the priest, take his confession. And the father hadn't been to a Catholic church in years and really didn't want to, but it was like, all right, I'll talk to the guy. Um, and so they wandered around the field and they talked and they looked very engaged and David didn't know the half of what they were talking about because he didn't have the ears to hear it. And when they got back together, John O'Donohue, the former priest, said to David White's father, go and sin beautifully. <laughs> so this poem is by that John O'Donohue, the former Catholic priest. And it's called Beanacht, which I believe is a word meaning blessing. And there's one word in this poem that you won't be um, familiar with. It's kirach. And basically, a kirach is basically a stretch of very marshy ground. It's something that they refer to in Ireland. So you'll, you'll see that word in the poem. On the day when the, dead, when the weight deadens on your shoulders, and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curach of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you. May there come across the waters a path of yellow sunlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. It might be added that um, John O'Donohue left the priesthood because of the trust that was broken by priest with the, um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> situation that happened the revelation that there were sexual abuse in the catholic church he was so upset by this that's why he left the priesthood he just felt that he could no longer trust the whole process so something really beautiful came out of that grief because he really focused his efforts on his writing and his poetry when he did that mm -hmm. and he came to Asheville, by the way did he he was here in Asheville a few years before he died he spoke at all souls cathedral were you there no, it was before I started attending all souls, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Oh. He was apparently just a giant of a man in terms of physical stature and also just his presence in the world. My favorite book by him is called Beauty. And it's a it's a it's a word I think if you're interested in poetry, probably speaks to you on some level. <clears throat> and I've never read a book about beauty like the one written by John O'Donohue, you would not think you could write a 120 page book on that one word, but yes, he has managed to do that. And it is not redundant in any way. I cannot recommend it more highly. It's really about the spiritual aspects of, of beauty. Mm. I'm wondering um, if anybody wants to share briefly about something you've, you've written down or a pattern or a location in yourself that you noticed tonight. Zoom meeting. Uh, I'll say something. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I can. I because I'm going to have to leave. I was just going to say that that 
phrase from Rilke, Rilke's poem, um, a feeling is, is, is how did I write it down? No feeling is final. Uh, I, I love that. It's wonderful. And I had, it has a deeper significance to me. So I really appreciate you sharing all of the poems and they were very helpful to me. And uh, the, pro the process that you had us do, very helpful. Oh, and wonderful. All I can say is Jay Baba and I will see you again soon, gang. Yeah, thanks for coming tonight, Lauren, and for sharing. Jay Baba, back yeah. to you. End meeting or leave meeting? Not yet. Too soon. <laughs> yeah, a little early. We have a few more surprises for you. Yeah, we do. Does anybody else want to share? Here, may I? Yeah. I'm not sure who this poet is, but this I've also liked too about um, grieving. It re it's by um, uh, Tryon Edwards. Maybe that's a familiar name to you, but not so much to me. But his poem, poem reads, I did not come to comfort you. Only God can do that. But I did come to say how deeply and tenderly I feel for you. Mm -hmm. mm. That's lovely. Beautiful. That's lovely. Mm -hmm. You like short poems. I do. I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I can concentrate that long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Um, Thomas You're Jefferson welcome. Thank said, you. simplicity implies greatness. <laughs> I believe it's true. So Telly, anything you'd like to share? Oh, I don't know if it was in the Rilke, but the phrase, don't let yourself lose me. Mm. Maybe think of, you know, holding on to Baba's Daman and not letting the ego um, <sighs> constantly rearing up. Yeah. Um, the phrase uh, from Coleman Barks, why did you stop praising? It certainly hit me. You know, at some point I feel like I froze up. And uh, I think it had a lot to do with grief, unprocessed grief. That's mm. um, an important recognition. Yeah. So, you prepare yourself for one sorrow, but another one comes. Mm -hmm. uh, And as we had shared earlier, uh, the, um, the guest house from Rumi reminds mm -hmm. me how grief serves that purpose of sweeping the mind clean of, of many uh, negative things. Yeah. And it's a deeper joy. Is it sweeping the strangers from your heart? Is that the line? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good one. So, lots of strangers. And I, I love John O'Donohue. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed reading in the Panam Kara for one, but I'll look mm -hmm. up Duty. I think that's a great recommendation. I appreciate that. Mm. Tracy, do you have another one you want to share? I have one I'd like to end with, but I'm um, just yeah, I can play that, that I can play that grief poem. Um, the one I mentioned. Uh, do you think that would be a good one to uh, to to play? I can play it from the CD. Yeah, sure. So this was a poem I wrote here in Asheville. Um, we have a fabulous poet named Glennis Redman who was doing a workshop at Malaprops, and uh, it was right before Christmas. And she said we're going to write a poem about grief, and I thought that is a last thing I want to do speaking of avoiding grief and so she said you know you don't have to read your poem you can just say pass when it's your turn to, to read so I so I wrote this poem and I thought to myself I am so saying pass when she comes to me because this is the worst poem written in the state of North Carolina and so of course everyone in the room read their poem and so I said to myself come on little sister read the poem just get it over with and when I read the poem out loud 
I realized it was not the worst poem written in the state of North Carolina. And it reminded me of how that great story by Daniel Ladinsky, who also figured out the importance of hearing poetry out loud. And um, he so wore his friend's ears out calling people and, uh, to you know, recite poetry to them over the phone that he had to resort to leaving poems on their voicemail. <laughs> well, there was something so powerful about just hearing it in the presence of another. And I wanna share that with you because for those of you who are writing, um, it is a really great tool to, um, to um, check in with a poem and hear the rhythm of it and hear the, the way it lands in the air and on your ear and the ear of others. It's a great tool. And uh, Mary Oliver was very fond of saying that poetry is meant to be read off the page. It's meant to be heard. Hmm. So um, it's something I really um, love to do when I'm feeling grief is just to listen to poetry. And there's lots of great you know, CDs out there that you can pick up on Amazon or just go to the internet. Um, so, um, in that light, I, uh, I recorded this poem, it's called Grief. Hopefully it's going to play for you. I don't know why it's not playing. I can recite it if it doesn't play. It has music with it, which is so great. Ah, it's not playing. Okay, I'll recite it. Grief, my tag-along noble friend. Grief that I was born with. Brought in on the tombs from Cairo. Smuggled in from Las Cruces. Nurtured into being on a reservation. Grief, my wrenching alcoholic father, mother, sister story. I need you no more. You have served me well, remembered my birthdays and Christmas, been there late at night. I don't know why I've outgrown your ashen, lonely colors, your pursed, downturned lips, your empty house, blood red and rageful. Rageful into the dusk and dawn of chained existence. Go, go and find your peace elsewhere. This heart is birthing love. Mm. Mm. I love that poem, Tracy. Thank you. I, I, uh, I would love a copy of that. Would yes, you, would put you your, email me a copy? Type, I would type, up, type up your email here on the sidebar and I will happily email you. No, it, it's okay. so deep and so well-rounded and pulls from the mm, past lives and this life and the continuity of it all and the termination of, of the need for it. I just love it. Yeah. You know, what was so interesting about writing that poem is I was in such a profound state of grief that when the words came out of my pen, this heart is birthing love. I, I literally looked at the page like, no, who, no, who wrote that? That was, I didn't write, I didn't write that. My heart's not birthing love. I'm really in a state of grief. It was, you know, it was one of that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. The soul, the soul. Oh, my heart's birthing love. That's just incredible. And, you know, so often poetry knows what we're feeling when we don't know what we're feeling. So it's a yeah. real check for poetry. Well, I just wanted to share that um, I, this night has been very special to me on the end of a special day because when we started out and um and evie said think you know to, to get in touch with something either recent or whatever i um a year and a half ago i had to put down my horse that i had gotten because baba said i want that horse 
to this 18 month old colt and it was a month shy of his 30th birthday and he was a magnificent creature and so bonded with Mara and Baba and I all of that presence every time we were together and the, yes the other day with my re, when I met my rehab person somehow it, I started crying about Azaw and you know it's like I I had a lot of grief I did a lot of grief in the beginning but I had a lot of joyful things happen but it was all mixed up together so tonight I was writing and um, that line about um, Kelly said it about uh, why have you stopped praising um, when I heard that it was like this little key in me got turned that that at a certain point I had shut down and let it just had creeped out a little bit here a little bit there when I'm reminded tears halted down halfway down your face and I just haven't been able to deal with the pain of expressing that. So tonight, as I started to miss, starting out missing what I miss about you and writing it down. And then at a certain point, um, these words came, um, the start of a poem and, and the feeling of, oh, I need to write about you now. Um, and it's just the opening lines. It's, I saw you first in the sky. You came to find me. A spirit presence of young clouds high above my gaze. And, uh, and I realized that a dam had been broken in terms of um, block, shutting down my creativity around these painful events because in your poem as well, Tracy, because when we get really in touch with that core stuff and let it happen, then this beautiful road opens out. And I have so much to write about him and, and Baba and Mara. And and so I so thankful. Thank you everyone for for just being present with me while for this wonderful breakthrough. Oh, thank you for sharing yeah. that. Like uh, that's so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So that's the thing, isn't it? Um, we carry grief. And if we can find a way to hold kindness with ourselves, it can begin to be expressed creatively. And I think that's what you, you did and you're sharing just now. Um, so if we can figure out how to nourish the grieving parts, we're and companioning them, we can move forward. And I, I'd like to, Tracy, you may have an ending poem and I, I've switched out what I was gonna do. So yeah. that's fine, okay. Um, this is one that I have loved for years. The poet's name is Naomi Shihab Nye and the poem is called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness is the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow is the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then 
It is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. So I'm gonna suggest that you just take one last look at your writing and see if there's one final word that comes up for you that sort of ties together the beads that you've created tonight in your reflection about yourself. And as you locate that word, I wonder where it might sit in your body. And I wonder what it might look like and what its size is and its color and shape and texture. And just let yourself imagine that for a moment and breathe into it and breathe with it. And maybe it's that word that you carry to bed with you tonight, like a good friend, a companion who knows you well. And just know that the riches in your psyche are companioning you always, even when you forget. And that simply by taking time to give yourself a breath, to pay attention to your body, and no matter how frightening, just to listen to the voices that come up and find a way to pick up your pen to write them down. And then as Tracy suggested, it makes a huge difference to read that work aloud to yourself. Or call your friends and leave it on their voicemail if you like. But primarily to let this witnessing part of you companion those other parts of you and just know that you journey with them. I just want to add, <clears throat> this is something that has been very um, meaning, meaningful for me as a child who I think grew up with sorrow um, to realize that <clears throat> there's really no feeling that any of us can have that someone else hasn't already had. And to know that we are really kind of, you know, woven together in these paths of, of grief and joy and ecstasy and devastation and loss and joy. And just to know that we're woven in these, these carpets of these feelings together and that you're, you're really never, because of that, you're really never alone. Not that just that Baba is here with us, but that we are essentially all here together in this, just to remember that whenever it feels heavy. And that poetry does such a powerful job of reminding us all of that. I feel deep appreciation for those of you who came on the call tonight and sharing your work and your inside feelings and thoughts. And I, I hope you continue to do that. Thank you. So do we have more of these meetings? I uh, just these, happen have, these happen every Wednesday at seven o'clock. We do so poetry, great. we do mystical poetry. This is and this is only the second one that Evie and I have done together. I hope not the last. <laughs> I hope not either. <laughs> we'll come up with some more really this was really lovely topics to cover. Mm. Um, I believe next week we are doing the work of Kabir. Um, we are going to be listening to um, Krishna Shukla, I don't know if how many of you know him from Varanasi, India, who recorded Kabir um, and played it with original instruments. And we will be talking about some of those translations, just Kabir, a, a bhakti poet, a devotional poet. Wonderful. India. Okay. So, yeah.
Yeah. Tracy, thank you for hosting tonight. Yes, wow, thank you for thank doing you. it with me, Evie. It was so much more fun to do it with you. That's <laughs> oh, great. Fabulous. Thank you, Evie. Oh. Jay Baba, everybody. Yeah, Jay Baba. Yeah. Jay Baba, this was really lovely. Thank you so much. Hey, Melanie. Hi. Bye. 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 Bye.